So uh, thanks so much for inviting me here today. It's a, it's a great honor to, to be here. Having worked in networking for over 30 years, um, I've, I've witnessed how Unix originally, BSD mostly, and then Linux shaped almost every aspect of networking uh, that, we, that we do today and how networking is done. It shaped how we teach our undergraduates at Stanford. The software infrastructure of Linux is a, an amazing example of networking at its best that we show to our students and we try to give them an experience getting their, getting their hands, hands dirty uh, uh, using it. And um, I feel like I'm coming home to the, to, to the home of where networking is done. I see that NetDev is growing from strength to strength. Uh, I don't know if whether it's the increased interest in, in open source or whether uh, nobody has anything to do during the, the pandemic, but I noticed that you had your, your most emails in a month uh, in May, nine, over 9,000 emails on your, on your listserv. So uh, I guess that, uh, that beats all the records in, in by quite a way. But seriously, I, I really applaud the devotion to open source. I'm, I'm a huge believer in the open source community for networking. Um, ever since it was, uh, it, it was not quite so, so fashionable or successful. Uh, in my group at Stanford, we put all of our work into the public domain and all of our software goes into open source. And uh, I really believe that open source is one of the biggest new unsung forces in networking. You know, despite all the buzzwords like SDN and NFE and disaggregation and all of that over the last 10 years, I think the real revolution in networking has been the coming of age of open source as a trustworthy infrastructure for how we run and operate networks. Because if you think about it, 10, 12 years ago, everybody used vertically integrated closed proprietary networking equipment. There was no other choice. And then the cloud service providers, and now more recently, the internet service providers and some mobile operators are starting investing very heavily. The top 10 data centers in the world, the top largest data centers in the world today, all run entirely off software that was homegrown, mostly open source, mostly Linux based. And one of the reasons I love this is not just because of the open source for the sake of it, but it helps networks become increasingly programmable by the owners, by the owners and operators. Because essentially what they've done is over the last few years, the owners and operators of large networks have stepped in and taken control over how their networks are, are run. It allows those who own and operate networks to differentiate and introduce new ideas for themselves. And I think that has to be good for networking in the, in the future. So a quick outline. This is a rough outline, a rough path through uh, what I'm going to be saying today. Through the, through the works of the, this, this group, Express Data Path eBPF has now let us program very fast forwarding behavior into the kernel. And in parallel, we're seeing new sort of a new class of programmable, usually P4 programmable forwarding pipelines, hardware accelerators, smart NICs, and, and switches. So how can we bring these benefits together end to end? Are they mutually exclusive? Are they in opposition to each other? Can we actually find a way to have the benefits of both? And I hope that we decide to figure this out together because I think that separately, um, this, will, this will only confuse developers and, and users. So if we can figure out how to do this, I think that networking will be much better off for it. And that's why I'm here today to talk about that. Let me start with a little bit of my own journey. Um, this is actually uh, uh, all the way back to 1990. Uh, the story I'd like to, 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 to share with you was uh, when I was a graduate student at Berkeley, um, just down the corridor from where um, my Carol and, and Van Jacobson were working on, uh, I guess at that time, 4.4 BSD. The internet was still called the NSF net and routers were called Cisco boxes, if you can believe it. Uh, Cisco was building routers based on CPUs that were connected to each other over a VME backbone, a backplane. And uh, they could process a whopping 10,000 packets per second. I remember when the first 10,000 packet per second router was, uh, was announced. 
And as, as graduate students, we were kind of fearless and didn't really know what we were doing. So we thought it would be fun to try and build a multi-port FDDI router, which we called the Bay Bridge. And this Bay Bridge shown here uh, had the intent of trying to kind of one-up the commercial, device, uh, commercial systems. There were these new programmable logic devices called CPL CPLDs, Complex uh, Programmable Logic Devices. And they were a little bit like the, the precursor to the FPGA. And they, they, could, they contained about 10,000 logic gates. And so we set out to build a hardware accelerator um, that could accelerate the core of a router. And we contro controlled it from the S bus of a Sun workstation. Um, this is the uh, hardware in the middle here uh, that was actually doing the packet processing. Um, and then at the top here is the Sun workstation that we were using to, to control it. And the packets were processed in hardware in something that we called the protocol converter. So we developed our own microcode language, it seemed, seemed like the right thing to do at the time, for expressing how the packets should be, should be processed. The good news was that this made it very fast for the time. It could process uh, over 100,000 packets per second, about 10 times the fastest commercial routers at the time. Not that surprising because they were built from, from CPUs and not particularly optimized for performance. Um, it sat on the, the Berkeley campus FDDI ring for about five years, uh, and we went off to do other things. I, the, we were, at the time, we were interested in zero-copy uh, stacks, the memory-mapped interfaces that were inspired by Van Jacobson's work on the Witless driver that some of you may remember. And uh, so we were trying to figure out how to do that. We went away for a while, and then we came back. And we came back because we wanted to add some features to this, to this router. Um, and this was my first wake-up call on the rapid obsolescence, not only of microcode that, uh, that you've had to struggle over to try and get the machine to work, but the obsolescence of brain cells because we couldn't remember how to program it. And so it took us longer to add a simple feature, I think it was just doing an ACL, than it had, done to, than it had taken us to originally program the base behavior. So this, this lesson struck with, stuck with me for many years. So having something that was programmable, that was a VLIW microcontroller, it seemed super clever at the, at, at the time. But um, it, it made me very skeptical of the idea of hardware accelerators, things that you would program in microcode for whether that's switches or, or NICs. So when the, when the term NPU, or network processor, started to be used in the late 1990s, uh, I was extremely skeptical. I would debate and argue on panels with NPU designers that NPUs just weren't the right solution for the problem. Um, NPUs such as the, the IXP were basically an array of CPU cores thrown onto a die. It's a little harsh, but it wasn't as though they had stepped back and said, what is the right way to build a domain-specific processor for processing uh, packet headers. Incoming packets were sent to a core, and then they had a process to go to, to a run-to-completion model. Um, it struck me as, as, as a little bit lazy, actually, because you, you were using the same instruction set, the same model of parallelism that was on a CPU that wasn't actually designed for networking in the, fa in the first place. Networking, as we know, to process packets at high speed, we need extremely deep pipelines and very, very fast I.O., neither of which is present, whether it's a single, single, single CPU or an array of cores. And they were a real pain in the neck to program, too. Uh, if you've ever tried programming one, you know what I, you know what I mean. Uh, you couldn't get the, run, the code to run deterministically. You had to start basically start over each time you wanted to add a new, new feature. So networking customers, as we know, and, bench and, and, and industry benchmarks kind of demand that we have reliable line rate deterministic processing of packets. So it just struck me as kind of the wrong way of approaching it. So I continue to be a big skeptic of MPUs and programmable approaches, FPGAs, et cetera, for forwarding, um, whether it was in the CPU or not. And I, would, I got into the habit of including this slide in many of my, in many of my talks. Um, it may be a bit of a cheap shot, but it compares the speed of switch chips. I've extended it since out until today in 2020. But it compares the speed of switch chips for which today we're at about 12.8 terabits per second. You can go and buy a switch chip from two or three different vendors uh, with 128 ports of 100 gig um, on them. 
And uh, as, as a consequence, you know, you really have to ask the question of what would it take for a CPU to keep up? If I look at the sort of the hero experiments that have been done, we can debate and argue about the particular numbers on here. This is roughly how the sort of two or three protocols being processed uh, in the, in, in, whether it's in the kernel or, or, or in, in user space or on bare metal on a, on a CPU. And, and when I started collecting this graph back in about 2000, the difference in speed was about 5x between the two. Now it's over 100x. So I came to the conclusion that it was inevitable that for the very highest performance, we would always use something that was fixed. That was the conclusion I came to the, 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 the time that would be based on a deep pipeline, high-speed I.O., and a fixed sequence of operations that corresponded to standard protocols. This would give us the lowest power, the most likely that we could fit it onto a single die, and therefore the lowest overall cost. Just to make a comparison, today you can buy a switch chip that will do roughly 10, 10 terabits per second, uh, process 40 protocols for about 400 watts, round numbers. If you wanted to do 10 terabits per second on CPUs and only four protocols, it would require about 25 kilowatts. So the difference doesn't make the, the CPU an alternative for the very highest performance. And why is this? The CPU is optimized for memory load store and locality and caches. The switch ASIC is optimized for IO and deep pipelining corresponding to the problem that it's trying to address. So my takeaway is that switches will be ASICs for the foreseeable future. And I got into the habit of, of, of quoting this, and in fact, I think I may have been the one that originally said it, so I don't think that makes it a conventional wisdom, but it, it, was, it was something that uh, I think was very much on many people's mind at the time, that programmable switches run 10 to 100 times slower, consume more power, and cost more inherently. The industry went the direction of fixed pipelines, uh, and this is a sort of a cartoon picture of the, what the majority of the insides of a switch ASIC uh, look like today. Packets would arrive on the red, in, on, on the red lines on the left-hand side of the, of the slide, go through a parser which has been fixed and baked into hardware that tells it the protocols that it's expected to see and how to split apart or, or type the, the, the header fields that it will find, and then go th along a, a pipeline so that multiple packets are being processed in parallel at the same time at different processing stages all with fixed functions. And the reason for the pipeline is the parallelism that it gives, but also uh, that, that, that because there's a little bit of serial dependency in, in header processing, it kind of helps you to have it in a pipeline so you can do one thing after another. And eventually the packets are sent out along their way. The limitations of this are obviously pretty clear. If you have a, uh, a, a, a router or a switch for which you've got some functionality that you want to um, uh, that, that, that you want to show, you've got some uh, uh, something like OSPF, BGP, other routing protocols on the top, and then a switch OS, which is controlling a pipeline underneath. As packets come through, headers are processed like this, and as those um, as those headers are being processed in that pipeline, it's, it makes sense to to ask, can I add new functionality? So, um, as an example, back in two thousand and ten there was a desire to add VXLAN as a new packet header field. Uh, VXLAN was, I think, originally pro proposed by VMware and Cisco for the purpose of identifying different tenants within a multi-tenant uh, data center. So if you wanted to add the software, it was essentially adding a new table to the software at the top, at, at, at the top and being able to index into that table as packets arrived. But because it required a new packet header that the chips didn't know about, it required the addition of a new pipeline stage. So whereas adding the software at the top probably took a few weeks, maybe a month or two to, to, to add, it was four years before the first merchant switching silicon showed up that had this part of the pipeline. Now you could say it's a kind of an esoteric feature, but it wasn't. It was the most sought after feature in the most profitable part of networking at the time. And it took four years to add a new feature. I know it takes a long time to add new things to the kernel, but even at four years, this is uh, this is kind of pretty uh, pretty crazy. And so it just it just strikes me that we have the wrong development model when it comes to changing, modifying, upgrading, 
adding new ideas to the way that we process packets in, in networks. And it's not surprising that the sort of the, the, the way that we process packets has moved very slowly and stagnated. And at the end of the day, it's determined by chip designers and chip designers don't operate networks. So the first programmable switches that came along um, were in terms of the approach, there were lo uh, separate logic devices like the one I showed you earlier or FPGAs, NPUs, and sort of some ASICs, for example, Fulcrum Easy Chip x -Pliant, and the Cisco Doppler, there are a few more too that, that were around. Um, but none made it really very easy to write for, for developers to write code for themselves. Um, they, they usually had sort of fairly complex uh, programming models internally. And so therefore they had to rely on, the, or the developers had to rely on the device manufacturer to write the code. And as I say, device manufacturers don't operate large networks, chip designers don't operate large networks, so they're not quite sure what to add. They're not gonna be the ones to innovate. So they tend to fall back to just implementing existing standards. Um, and that means that everything is specified bottom up from the way that the chip is designed. And it's very hard to introduce new ideas and everything kind of tends to stagnate. So what, what would work as, a, as, as an alternative approach and, and, and kind of what was needed? Uh, there, were, there were a bunch of us that were kind of looking over the wall into other areas of compute uh, and wondering what was being done there. We're all familiar with this model, of course, we write in a high level language, compile down to run on a CPU, and it's general purpose CPU kind of optimized to be able to accept a general purpose program. Graphics uh, has been one of the most successful uh, creations of both a, a domain specific processor and a domain specific language to, to program it. We know the model, we write programs at a high level, we compile them down to run very fast on that hardware. The key thing about that device is, it has an instruction set that's optimized for graphics and rendering, et cetera, and it turned out for machine learning as well. And it has a good model of parallelism that allows these programs to run very fast. For those of you who remember the digital signal processors that were originally designed way back in the sort of the 1980s, 1990s, the same model again, and then more recently, the, uh, the TPU for machine learning. So this high level language compiled down to a, a device which has been op optimized from an instruction set and a model of parallelism seems to be the way that we're going. And it had never really happened in network, networking. We didn't have the language that allowed you to express a behavior that would lend itself to running at very high speed in a unrolled feed forward path on, on, on a hardware accelerator. And we didn't have the devices upon which they would run. So stepping back in about 2010, uh, a, a, a few of us started to ask the question, what would it take to design a new domain specific processor that was optimized for processing packet headers? That was easy for network owners and operators to program for themselves and could be programmed using a high level language that was independent of the hardware, such that the compiled code always runs at line rate. You don't have to think about it without compromising power, performance, or area. What, what would it take to do that? Now, I wasn't gonna be able to figure this one out on my own, so I teamed up with a group of folks at T Texas Instruments, and we started a, a project between Stanford and TI at that time. And uh, when TI got out of the big ASIC business, we uh, moved this into what became Barefoot Networks. And I was lucky to work with both Pat Bossart and Martin Izzard on the creation of, of, of Barefoot and some of these ideas. And the basic idea was to try and identify that language and that, that processor. We were, were, became sort of interested in the, uh, the, the P4 language and helping to uh, sort of establish that, uh, that movement around a language that, for which you could specify behaviors that would be compiled down to run at line rate. And then for the forwarding pipeline, uh, we came to call that PISA for the protocol independent switch architecture. This is sort of a cartoon picture here. Um, some of you may have seen it before, but I'm just gonna go briefly through how this works, to give you a sense of what the kind of the forwarding model was that we had in mind. So packets would arrive on the left, just as they did on the fixed function pipeline, and then they enter the parser. So instead of being fixed, this parser is programmable. It's essentially a state machine that you describe the, how, the, how the packets are, 
um, how the packets are constructed and how you find one header from, from another. And uh, from a software point of view, it's essentially typing the packet header, st stripping apart the, the packet header fields and then sticking them onto this big blue bus that goes through a typical implementation might have a several thousand bit wide bus that then goes down this pipeline. Each stage of the pipeline is processing a packet at the same time. So in this particular case with four stages, it would be processing four packets at the same time. And the longer the pipeline, the more parallelism that you, that you have. Each of these stages shown here is identical, uh, contains a second dimension of parallelism. So we have parallelism in the pipeline, and then within each stage, parallelism, because there are multiple match action stages, each of those is designed to have a general purpose match uh, across exact matches or associative matches, and then actions uh, through a little uh, ALU. There might be, and th th this picture only, only shows sort of six of these in any one stage, but there might be hundreds of them in each stage. So as the packets come down, the fields are directed to the match action units. The little processor will do processing upon it, and then the modified packet would be stacked back onto the, the, the bus. Some of the key things that we, uh, that we learned from, from doing this was the stages of this pipeline are all exactly the same. It turns out that uh, it's very, very tempting to optimize the resources that are in any one stage because of the knowledge that we have about current protocols. Oh, will we tend to do L3 before we do L4? Things like that. And so therefore we'll put this, the longest prefix match in the, in the earlier stage. It turns out that this, this gives so many restrictions to the compiler that it becomes very hard to develop a good compiler as a consequence. So in the designs that I've been part of, all of the stages are identical and the number of stages is determined by the degree of serial dependency in the programs. So this one shows four because that's all I could fit on the PowerPoint slide, but typically in practice there's sort of 16, 20, 25 stages uh, just to be able to provide room for programmers to add their own new features over and above basic protocols. So just to explain this in the sort of in the animated version, um, the packet arrives on the left hand side, the different colored packet header fields are just supposed to represent different protocol fields. So the parser will break them out according to a program that the user is, has provided. And then as those headers are presented to the match and action stages down the pipeline, they will get transformed. They will they, they potentially could get removed. If you're popping a tag, for example, there could be an encapsulation, so new headers are created. Fields could get modified, decrements, updating of checksums, things like that. And then as it goes down each stage, it's going to get transformed according to the match action stages and rules that have been placed into that table. And at the end, there's a packet gets reformed and then sent on its way. This is sort of the basic operation, and then it's pro programmed using the P4 language. And the P4 language is essentially expressing three things. First of all, it's telling the parser how to parse the packets. That's on the left-hand side. It's telling uh, the match action units how matches are structured. So it's explaining the tables, uh, specifying the tables. What are the, how do you match? What fields do you match upon? And then what actions you put, what you perform? Initially, this pipeline doesn't know anything about any protocol. It doesn't know about IPv4, IPv6, uh, et cetera. And so you're telling it and describing it how it's going to, how it's going to program the packets. And then finally, on the right hand side is the control flow. This is a sequence of tables that a packet will pass through on its way through that, uh, through that pipeline. So you might be thinking, okay, this is all very good. Um, actually, that pipeline looks pretty much like the fixed function one. Uh, so what's the big difference? Clearly the big difference is that you can change what you place into this device. And uh, as you probably know, Barefoot built, uh, built switches that are based on this, this model called Tofino 1 and Tofino 2. And uh, it's gonna surprise me the way in which people use those devices. Obviously they tend to use them with standard protocols that we all know and love, IPv4, IPv6, etc. But they also add things in that are custom to their environment, whether it's for doing load balancing is a very common, layer for load balancing is a very common application. Um, adding telemetry, INT, inbound network telemetry, 
for capturing metadata about queue occupancy, switch ID, etc. as the packet passes by. We've seen all sorts of things that, uh, that different people have done. I've even seen people use IP with uh, non-standard address sizes. Um, I'm not sure I particularly recommend it. I don't know why someone did that. Uh, I think they had a 48-bit IPv4 address. Each to their own. So you might be thinking also, uh, there must be a penalty for this. Right? So what's the penalty for this programmability? We're used to the idea that a dedicated fixed function device must consume less power, less area, and therefore be cheaper, and have higher performance. After all, that's what the conventional wisdom had told us. So what I want to do is to, to just show you one example. Uh, I, I hate showing things that look like marketing slides, uh, but I'm only showing you this because it's scraped from the website of a big switch vendor who happens to sell switches that use the P4 programmable Tofino device shown in blue on the left against the sort of the standard fixed function device. So they were both built out of the same process, 16 nanometer TSMC process. They both had 6,400 gig ports, 6.4 terabits per second total, total capacity. Um, the faceplates of the boxes looked, uh, looked identical. The set of protocols and features was pretty much the same. So in terms of the performance, the maximum packets per second, it was essentially the same. The programmable device was slightly higher at just over 5 billion packets per second. Um, by the way, if you stop and think about 5 billion packets per second, uh, compare that with 1992 of uh, when we first had 100,000 packets per second, it's pretty amazing how things have moved on. At 5 billion packets per second, uh, that means every time a... Uh, a photon moves uh, one foot, you've processed five packets. Uh, it's, it's kind of crazy to think about. In terms of power, power was slightly lower for this particular configuration. We'll say it's the same. It was essentially the same unchanged. And from a latency point of view, because the number of pipeline stages <clears throat> determines the, uh, the, the, the overall latency, because in a device that you're programming, you don't include the protocols that you don't want, it's often the case that the, uh, the latency ends up being slightly lower. But we'll call it the same. So it's essentially the same. It makes no difference. And this should tell us something, right? It should tell us that in future, if you can build switches that are of the same power performance and area, then probably you will because it gives you more flexibility. Even if you end up using the same protocols that you used before, it gives you it gives you protection against the unknown. It allows you to change table sizes, but it allows you, of course, to introduce new features as you go. If you want to learn more about the P4 language, um, there's an original paper shown here from um, that, 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 that was published back in about 2014. And, and there's also p4.org uh, where you'll find code and specification, etc. Um, this isn't a tutorial on P4, so I'm not going to spend any any time on that right now. But the basics are essentially the following. It's a language for specifying both stateless and stateful forwarding behavior in pipelines. It allows you to program a sequence of parsing, tables, actions, control flow that are not necessarily structured in the as the PISA pipeline. P416 allows you to describe different architectures. So there are um, uh, are, are ways in which you can compile to a variety of different structures uh, from with the idea of making it so that you can have different structures constructed in different ways by different different vendors. The compiler, the language is designed to allow the compiler to find dependencies and opportunities for parallelism by expressing the forwarding behavior at a high level, but being careful to specify the specific set of operations that you want to have happen. It means that it can build a serial dependency graph and therefore figure out what the opportunities for parallelism are. Um, it's loop free, event driven by packets and there's no program counter. So, you know, in some ways it's similar to EPPF. Um, it's designed to be, uh, be safe in the sense of it's type safe and uh, memory safe. Packets are processed always at line rate in the PISA pipeline because it's a feed forward pipeline. And so you've got a deterministic time through the, uh, through the device. And also because of the clock rate is always constant because of those pipeline stages, it means that you end up with a deterministic throughput. The, the code is, uh, or the idea of P4 is that you can write code that is hardware independent. Now in practice, because of the specifics of the, of the pipeline, 
you end up having to tailor it somewhat to the particular device. To, in, in order to encourage portability, there is a uh, what's called the PSA or portable switch architecture, which is a forwarding model for writing code to that should work on any device. So this means that people can share code that were that was written for the for the PSA, and then you can extend it via opaque externs. So this is for functions that have been forgotten or weren't considered important at the time, or where someone has a proprietary extension to their device that they want to be able to program and access. So for example, the pipelines today don't allow you to program the traffic manager. You configure that separately. One could easily imagine an extension in the future in which you're programming the behavior of the traffic manager, and there have been some papers and ideas about this and some prototypes. So this would be an example, or encryption and decryption, which today are not readily expressible within the P4 language. So now that's been around for a while in switches, you can see it beginning to show up in NICs as well, in uh, uh, so-called smart NICs. Um, this is a very sort of crude picture on the left-hand side of a PISA pipeline for packets going from the CPU out to the wire and, and vice versa. Typically, there's a bunch of cores there as well. The top right-hand corner is the, the recently discussed Pensando NIC, and then there's the uh, Alveo board from Xilinx, which they program with the SDNet uh, P4 compiler. So we're going to, I think we're going to start seeing these show up more and more as a model for expressing the forwarding behavior. In the pipelines, not necessarily in the cores, but uh, for the pipelines, it allows you to have a deterministic forwarding behavior. Okay, programmable switches, programmable NICs. Stepping back again, what does this mean for where we're, for where we're headed? Sort of taking stock of where we are today, uh, the, the, the movement towards disaggregation, which often gets described as about, about cost, about cost reduction, I really think that it's about something slightly different. I think disaggregation is about network owners and operators taking control of the software that controls their networks. I think that's what it was really about and continues to be about. They want to be in charge because they, they, it's their lifeblood, and so they need to make sure that it's secure, reliable, and they can extend it to be able to differentiate from their competition. And now they're starting to take control of how the packets are processed too because of the availability of programmable switches and, and NICs. And that's a sort of a transition that's just happening now. And this sort of deep programmability in the, the NICs, the switches, the vSwitches, of course, they always were, and the end host networking stack, they're becoming more malleable. But now we're at the point where everything from the beginning to the end, from one end to the other, is more malleable than it was before. So this opens up some interesting possibilities. And where I want to go next is to address this question, what, what does this mean for how networks are programmed? What does this mean for how we will develop code, develop systems, develop networks? What does it mean for how large networks will be, will be operated? So I think this first point is, is perhaps obvious, that we will start to think of a network as a programmable platform. The behavior will be described at the top and eventually, my hope is that it will be partitioned, compiled, and then run across the elements. We're not there yet. We have a lot of work to, to, to get there. But I do think that this thinking of it as a programmable platform is just beginning to happen now, rather than a collection of different elements. I think every data center will work differently. It will be programmed and tailored locally uh, maybe to make it simpler, to throw out protocols you don't need to make it more reliable, or to add security measures, whatever is needed. A slightly more controversial statement, I, I don't think we'll think in protocols nearly as much as we do today. Instead, we're going to think in terms of software. All functions and protocols will be will we'll have migrated up and out of the hardware into software throughout the internet. I think this will be true of every aspect of the internet. Many of you probably think like this and have this mindset already, so this doesn't come as news to you. But most of the most networking development is still stuck in interoperability. Interoperability mattered a lot when you were building devices bottom up, having to make sure that they connected together correctly. 
typically large networks today are somewhat homogeneous. They, they tend to use uh, very similar equipment. If you can actually program it top down and express the behavior that you want such that it's consistent across all the devices, interoperability will matter, but much less than it used to because you're specifying the behavior that you want and therefore the interoperability should come from design. We have to figure out what this means for networking students. Uh, they're going to learn how to program a network top down as a distributed computing platform. And so our classes will have to evolve in this direction. And we're trying to see what that means at the moment. Um, I do think that we'll start to describe protocols in maybe even quaint historical terms. Routing and congestion control will be programs partitioned and across the system by a compiler. What I think is really potentially game changing in the sort of the next wave that I think could be absolutely huge is the introduction of software engineering techniques routinely into networking. If you think about it, if we're programming our networks as a platform top down, where we have a specification of the desired behavior at the top, then we can work down towards where the packets are processed across either all of the layers of abstraction as we go down, the APIs as we head down towards the packets. It gives us an opportunity to, to check the correctness of that behavior, whether it's through just clever unit testing all the way through to formal verification and validation on the fly. Uh, for me, this is reminiscent of the, actually of the chip industry, which does this very cleverly of formal verification across boundaries as you head down to a more and more detailed description all the way down to the transistor layout. But in any big system, having that ability to check that the behavior of individual packets corresponds to the original intended behavior is a long way from where we are today. But many of these techniques either exist today or are within our reach and being researched and demonstrated in prototype form. I think there's a lot of exciting work to be done there. I do think that fine grain per packet measurement will, will become very popular and very widespread, not just through inbound network telemetry, INT. I think that will be one part of it. I think there will be many flavors. Uh, many improvements over time. As soon as a device is programmable, the owners and operators can decide what they measure for themselves. And as soon as you can measure for yourself what you want, you will measure something different from somebody at a different company or that I would ever think up. And so there will be a lot of innovation, I think, in, in telemetry. Um, increasing amount of stream uh, computation is being placed into these accelerators. Uh, it's starting out with things that you would expect, firewalls, gateways, load balancers, but you can do things like DNS caches uh, that will be placed in the tables of one of these devices. Some people have implemented um, key value stores for as a cache to the front end of a, of a memcache system. And so there've been a variety of these different, uh, of different devices, not to replace a CPU, but to do what it does well, which is to do stream processing and match and action rules, a little bit of stateful processing. And so if you can offload some of that, then it can accelerate some, some things that we would be also doing within a CPU. But I think the eventual goal is that we will have networks that are programmed by many and operated by few. In other words, they're programmed by owners, operators, Anybody who has a network, anybody who's studying and learning about networks, anybody who's doing research in networking, they would be the programmers. And hopefully the networks would be operated by a lot fewer people than they are today. Uh, last time I looked at Stanford, we have a population of about 35,000 people on campus during normal, during normal times. We have about 200 people keeping the network going. And uh, if you compare that to the telephone system of old, it took about three people to do that. So we clearly haven't quite got it right yet in terms of making networks simple to operate and manage. Same goes whether it's on a small scale, whether it's in a Wi-Fi network or in a large ISP or mobile operator. Because if you can hand them the ability to express what they can measure, what they can observe, what they can see in their networks, and then hand them the ability to then decide how they control the network based on what they can see, they will do things differently and they will tend to, do, to move in a direction of simpler, more reliable, more secure, and a lower cost of, of, of operation. Just to give you an example of what I, what, what I mean by this, this is a this is sort of cartoon picture of, of, of a large cloud or ISP. 
in this particular case showing the separation of control from forwarding plane just as an example so this would be illustrative of say google or vmware in the way that they structure their networks you have a control plane control apps running routing protocols virtualization this type of thing that's reaching down and then controlling a pipeline of switches NICs, and v switches uh, along the along the path the switch os that would be sitting on each of these of these switches um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with, with many of those like FBOS and Sonic, etc. And then that control plane could be a proprietary one. It could be an open source one like, uh, like ONOS from the Open Networking Foundation. I think of these NICs and switches of being programmed to have a specific behavior, perhaps in the P4 language. There may be other languages that emerge too. And those that, that language expressing and specifying that forwarding behavior. And then some means to take that expression of the program and turn it into an API that the control plane can use. Some of you may be familiar with the P4 runtime contract that was developed between uh, uh, Barefoot originally and Google, which is a, a, an open source way of maintaining a contract between that control plane and the forwarding plane. As you update the program that's specifying the behavior, it might expose new APIs, new calls, to the control plane. So you want those exposed on the fly without having to reboot the, reboot the system. So that could be an example of, of, of how that takes place. However it happens, however that contract is formed between the control plane and the, and the forwarding plane, it gives us the ability to now express the behavior from the top and work down towards how the packets are processed. And the reason I keep, I keep dwelling on this processing from the top down or expressing from the top down is because I think those who own networks, who, who are doing DevOps and developing their own networks, are sort of realizing that taking charge of the control plane software was a big deal. But at the end of the day, their network is passing packets from one place to another. Let's face it, that's all the network does. And as the packets go by, we look at some headers and twiddle some bits. That's really all that goes, goes on. So if they're not in charge of how the packets are processed, then they're not really in charge of how the network operates. So taking more and more control of it seems kind of inevitable. Now I've shown the pipeline here of just the switches and the NICs. Of course, this extends into the end host as well through the kernel and up into to user space as, as well. So if we're to think of this as a programmable platform, what are people going to do with it? What is the kind of the next step uh, along, this, along this path? I've already said that I think that they will measure, they will measure a lot of metadata about the packets. So as, as I'm sure you know, every packet as it passes through a network goes to a switch. And as it hits a switch, that switch knows, of course, its own ID, the switch's ID. It knows the delay that this packet faces, the amount of queue, the queuing delay that it experiences, the latency across the switch, the other packets that it shared the queue with, all of this metadata becomes available to the programmer if the switch or the, or the smart NIC is programmable and allows you to add that data into the packet or shoot off a telemetry packet as it goes by. And if you think about how, what a, what a far cry this is from, uh, from traceroute and ping, the things that we've relied on for, for 20 or 30 years now, I'm pretty sure that people are going to adopt, as they already are doing, they're going to adopt and, 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 and modify the way in which they, they collect data, primarily to make their networks easier to debug. But once they can do this, there's a logical next stage of being able to take a packet and asking, does this packet conform to my original intended behavior, the original specified behavior, behavior of the network. If I look at it and see the sequence of switches that it visited, was that a legal uh, set of switches? Was that a legal path? Is there a problem in the network because of misconfiguration, a routing table state, or a routing protocol? Is there a security violation that has allowed a packet to take a path that it shouldn't? So as soon as you can do that and ask questions of functionality and performance, then I think that this, this verification and validation will happen faster and faster, leading to potentially an update of the state 
that is that is managing the network, maybe even the control code itself and the forwarding forwarding code. I think it'll be a while before this is done completely automatically, but uh, maybe in the sort of the science fiction future of ten or fifteen years' time, that might happen. But that that closing of the loop is this is how I think that closing of the loop to make the network control and management more automatic will happen. It's not because the chip vendor will come up with a feature that they need. It's not because the equipment vendor will come up with a feature. It's because the network owner and operator realizing the problem that they have to solve will figure out how to do this for themselves. So what does it mean for, 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 for us? Together, we're all thinking about how this pipeline is programmed. How can we write code that is clear, familiar, runs at line rate, and can be moved around within this pipeline to the place that it rightfully belongs? So I've drawn out a pipeline here corresponding a little bit to the, to the hardware pipeline below of devices consisting of the user space kernel, the NIC, the switch, and then the same thing on the right-hand side reflected. And we're going to think about what code belongs in there or what, what, what things belong in each of those, in those blocks. I'm going to abbreviate that with U for user space, K for kernel, N for NIC, X for, for switch, just to make it a little, uh, a little cleaner. These parts already exist, work extremely well. There's a large body of programmers, many of them whom of you are here today, who are extremely adept at programming in this model. In the switches in the middle, this PISA pipeline and this P4 language is, is increasingly being used. And I think this is going to appear on the NICs as well. So we have a little bit of a potential collision of two sort of viewpoints and two ways of doing things. Um, at the end of the day, everything trying to do efficient, fast processing of packets in a familiar, easy to use way. But uh, I'm not here to say that we should abandon the use of C or C++ or anything like that. It's a remarkably successful way of programming behaviors. But as we already see with, with XD, XDP and EPPF, you've clearly got to provide a uh, a constrained way of, of programming in order for it to operate safely within the kernel. So it sort of begs thinking, how can we get the benefits of both of these ways of thinking in order to be able to make sure that our code can run at line rate on these, on these accelerators? So let's take an example of some sort of behavior that we might be interested in. And, and, and I want to use this as a way of explaining why I think we might need to move functionality around and give the programmer the ability to do that. So if you've been tracking how congestion control has been uh, changing over time and evolving over time, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm stepping into dangerous ground here because everybody has their own sort of religious convictions about the way that congestion control will be done. I'm not here to say that one method is better than another, just merely to observe that different large cloud and service uh, cloud service provider and data center operators have been experimenting with or deploying a variety of different techniques. Of course, in the you know originally we used the packet drops and duplicate acts as the primary form of uh, the indication of congestion at the endpoint. And I, uh, I put this with a K here to say that that, uh, that signal is observed mostly by the kernel in order to be able to identify the congestion. And that's where TCP is running, as you know. Imagine that you're, you're implementing a method like, um, uh, like, like TCP uh, uh, Vegas or uh, like uh, timely uh, as described by Google. They use RTT as the primary measure of congestion, the onset of congestion, and in which case they need very accurate timers and ideally running out on the, the NIC. So this would be something you'd like in the, in the NIC. Last year, there was a paper that Alibaba published about something called HPCC, where they used um, information about the queue occupancy and the buildup of the queues in the switches. Uh, their argument being, if the switch is where the congestion is, then why don't we have a direct measure of what that queue occupancy is as a direct explicit measure of what the congestion is. And so that's being taken place at the, at the switch, X here. 
In order to be able to report it back, you need to modify a packet header, either by creating a new one or, or overwriting or, or reusing a, another field. And so you need a new header format, and then eventually both the NIC and the kernel will need to know about that. So that involves changing three things here. As soon as you start thinking about how you can have congestion control in VMs and containers that might be different with the underlying one that's taking place in the kernel or out on the NIC, it all gets a little bit confusing. And you can imagine that you would want to move things around and have this functionality change to different places over time as we learn more and as we, as we evolve. So there'd be a sort of a simple example. Routing is another example. Today, pretty much all routing is done based on the forwarding information base that's in the switch. The kernel has to be aware of it, of course. So the uh, X and K both know about this. If you wanted to do congestion-based routing, um, which seems fairly popular, uh, there's a sort of an evolution of traffic engineering down to more congestion-based route, congestion-aware routing. In which case, yes, the the switch and the NIC both have to know about this, um, and uh, eventually you have to feed that information to the kernel in order to be able to make its decision as to where it sends the packet. And if you're doing source routing, then that information, almost by definition, is moving from the kernel, from the uh, 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 from from the switch to the kernel, to to K, and then you've got to make sure the switch knows because now you're taking over that that routing decision. So it means modifying the switch as well. So even if you take basically very simple operations like these the two fundamental operations of networking, congestion control and routing, you can see how if you allowed people to be able to move this functionality very easily between these different places, then they're probably over time going to do it and they will come up with better techniques as a consequence. <clears throat> so how might we actually do this? Um, I'm going to take the dangerous risk of putting down a very tentative straw man suggestion. There's lots of ways that we could do this, um, but I think that it deserves a lot of thought, a lot of careful thought, because I think if we can do this right, it will have dramatic consequences for the, for the field of networking as a whole. And I think we need to try and balance two things. One is an immense population of programmers of user space and kernel code. There's a lot of expertise, thousands and thousands of people who have, who have written a huge amount of code, many, many techniques that have been developed. And so we're gonna make sure that we maintain that. On the other hand, if you're trying to take that general purpose code and run it on a hardware accelerated pipeline, like in a NIC or in a switch, then it's gonna be very hard because you're expressing a behavior that doesn't necessarily fit onto that device. So you need to use some method that will constrain that programming so that it'll work on a feed-forward loop-free pipeline such that it uses the, the, the behavior that you, that you need. And you also need to express the overall pipeline that is the sequence or the, the, the sequence of devices whether it's the end host, the NICs, the switches, the vSwitches, and whatever device that you have in the network, like firewalls and gateways, you need a pipeline because if you're going to program it and partition this code across it, then you need a means to, to express it. So finding the right balance and combination is not entirely obvious. Here's, a, here's one way that we could think about it, which is to specify an overall structure using a language like P4, where you're expressing the serial dependency because ultimately you need things that will operate in a sequence that you get the dependencies correct and then they will sit in the correct location where they can be accelerated. But that using the extern function of, of P4, the majority of the code might actually be the existing conventional C++, C++, C++ code um, that will run on a CPU, particularly if you know that that code is always going to run on the end host. So something that is in user space or something that just belongs on the end host. There's no point in rewriting that into a new language. But then you could write P4 for, for, to specify behaviors that you know potentially will end up being accelerated in hardware. You might want to be able to move them around. A good example of this is um, there are behaviors that are programmed into SmartNICs today that uh, to do with security of the, of, of the VMs and containers that run in the cloud. If they're wanting to add bare metal devices like supercomputers, etc., then typically they can't trust a NIC connected to that, uh, that device because they don't control the software that runs on it. 
So typically they then move that same behavior, that same functionality over to the switch. And so if they're written in the same language and they have the same means of operating at, at line rate, it becomes very easy just to move that code over and port it over to the other, other device. So if you know that it needs to run at line rate in the network, then that is one way that you can do it. However, I don't think that the right way to do this is for either of the P4 community or the NetDev community to do this on their own because we have an expertise from two different from two different aspects of networking. And the best way to do this would be to try and figure it out ourselves. And in the true spirit of merit-based open source, that shouldn't come from someone like me. It should come from whoever is actually going to be doing that work and holding the pen and uh, on the keyboard. So my proposal is that the netdev and p4.org create a working group, um, however informally or formally, with the express intent of trying to figure out how this would come together and create an open source activity together that would allow this to, to, to move forwards. So returning to this picture, I just wanted to say a few parting words. Um, you know, I believe that networks are becoming deeply programmable. I really believe that over the next decade, this is gonna happen end to end, and that we need to work together to try and make this happen in a consistent, in a consistent way such that the behavior is specified at the top, partition and compiled down. I think if we do that, we're gonna see a lot more innovation in networking. I think we're gonna see it move and improve much faster than it has in the past. Those who own and operate networks, whether it's my home network or Amazon's cloud, they're gonna create the, the, the dials that they need to observe the behavior, and they're gonna create the control knobs that they need to change that behavior. And I think that most of the time they'll use it to make their network simpler. They will focus them on the small set of operations that they want. I don't think they're gonna make them much more complex. I think they're gonna figure out that set that they need in order to be able to make that more reliable, more secure. And our job is to figure out how to make it possible for them to do so. And I don't think we should take this responsibility lightly. I think done right, we can have a huge influence over how networks are built in future. And I think that's super exciting. And I hope that we can work together to do that. Thank you. So the first question in the chat from David was, if you'd be pressed to say something negative about Tofino ASICs performance cost operational wise in comparison to the more traditional ASICs, what would you say? Um, you know, whenever you produce something new, uh, it's, it, you know, it's a struggle to start with um, because, of course, if you're, you know, as many of you know, you're creating a new way of programming. Um, you need all of the, the tools, the visualization tools, the examples, the example applications. And uh, it always feels, once it's become obvious to you that, of course, this is absolutely the right way to do it. There's no other way to do it, right? Uh, we all fall into that trap. Then... Uh, having to find you have to spend a lot of time uh, working with people who are trying to make the difficult transition to thinking that way, going from something that was fixed that, that works to something that is that is programmable. So the the sort of the switch over cost to something new is always hard um, and um, not necessarily, and I would say less so because of the language. If any of you have looked at the P4 program uh, snippets, they're very familiar, they're e very easy to, to understand. If I was to give you a snippet of a, of, there's a thing called switch.p4, which is a few hundred lines of, few thousand lines of code that expresses the typical forwarding behavior for a modern switch ASIC. And uh, you, you'd be able to follow it and recognize what it's doing. So it's not the coding so much as the entire environment of just getting used to that way of thinking. Um, so there's a second question here. If, uh, so for the promotional slide, I'm not sure what this is. Is this using a rather limited use case or are the latency numbers, for example, significant for the real world? Um, I, I believe so. These are numbers taken from a, from a, from a large vendor. So uh, I don't think that they express what the use case was, but it was sort of their typical operating numbers. Um, do you know of efforts to get really open hardware descriptions to actually create an ASIC uh, yourself for P4, PISA? Ah, this is a great question. Um, I, I don't know of any efforts right now to create an open source switch. 
but there are certainly a variety of different uh, different models. The the front end compiler uh, for for P four is open source, as many of you know, and so you can generate from the back end C or um, other uh, 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 you know, uh, other models that you that you would want. Um, but if you actually want to do back end to a new device, uh, then it makes it pretty easy to do so. It's essentially the front end that gets used by Xilinx and others for their compilers for compiling to their devices as well. So they're sort of emerging. Um, I think this will happen over the next over the next few years. Risk Five is a great platform. Um, it, it's not clear whether it's the platform that you'd want for switching, but certainly for Nix and Smart Nix, it seems to be a, a very good device. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, so there, there are a bunch on the, would you prefer people type their questions on the chat? Oh, I'm fine either way. I don't mind. So, so Lily, you're, you're still not on video, so we'll just go to the chat then. The next person is William King, I think. You can read that. Uh, Nick. Oh, have you seen any progress to integrate a P4 programmable switch or SmartNIC that has enabled support for EPBF offload from the Linux kernel? Um, yeah, OK. Um, that is a great question. I think this gets right to the heart of what we need to be thinking about. Uh, I, the answer is sort of. I've seen some prototypes. Uh, I believe there are a couple of proprietary approaches to doing this. Um, and uh, you'll have seen some presentations here and elsewhere. Um, and you know, thinking along these lines, um, I don't know if William William too is is here on online from VMware. Clearly, been thinking along these lines as well. There was a P4 front end to OVS that was done as a research pro prototype by, by Mohammed Shabazz uh, when he was doing his PhD at Princeton. So there have been some some initial work for for doing this. Um, I think there's actually a big need. And I think that the, the, the knowing where to start is, is critical because you could just start by doing a straight P4 to EPPF or the other way around. And certainly some people have done that. Uh, Mihai Budio at, uh, at VMware has, has worked on that more uh, quite recently. And so I think many of you are probably familiar with that. So there's, you know, there's, there's, there's work and effort that's going on. I think the bigger question that we need to address is, so if you do this, how does it fit into that whole pipeline? Because if we do this piecemeal, we need the individual pieces for sure. But if we do this piecemeal, we don't end up with a consistent way of doing this across the entire pipeline. So that's the sort of the question that's most in my mind at the moment. I hope, uh, William, I hope that answers your, uh, your question. By all means, jump in if you've got a follow up. Uh, we're going to uh, pass it on to Salil next. Hey, Salil. I can't hear can, you. I, I can, can you guys hear him? No. OK. Uh, unmute yourself, please. Try that. No, nope, afraid we can't hear you. Okay, uh, let, let me jump to the next person and then we'll see how your video works. Okay, so- Taras, And Salil, if you wanna type it into the chat window, I can, uh, we can try and answer it from there too. Okay, so l l let me, um, are you gonna type it, Salil? Just nod if, yes. I, I can't hear you. I don't know right, if anybody else can hear you. No, no. Okay. Um, Oh, there's a Terrace. question here about, um, oh, okay, yeah, Taras. Taras. Yes, hi. Uh, so first of all, thank you for this uh, great uh, uh, <clears throat> speech. I'm wondering, uh, you know, I'm looking and thinking from the different direction, having this model and having this uh, flexibility from uh, bottom to up uh, will definitely, for not force, but um, leads for the cloud providers, huge cloud providers, to simplify their networks, to remove some um, matches, to remove some headers from the protocol, etc. cetera. Uh, so their networks will become much, much more faster, maybe less latency, etc. But what will happen what, when we will end up having three, five, or 10 huge cloud vendors that have their own redesigned networking? how we will interconnect them, who will be 
responsible for managing this um, standard way because we will now have five or six different ways of doing network. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, there's a, the, I, I understand the fear. Uh, the fear is palpable, right? I, I you sort of uh, feel, feel, feel it in your stomach, right? <laughs> of what might happen if everybody was to try, you could just sort of picture people coming together in, uh, uh, in an IXP or something like this and saying, how do we get these things to, there's a, there's a great New Yorker cartoon here somewhere. Um, but seriously, I think what, what, what is already happening is that the insides of cloud service provider networks are already non-standard. They're already adding their own capabilities. And they know uh, that in order to speak to the rest of the world, then they have to meet standards, interoperable standards at boundaries on the, uh, the interconnect. So everybody has to speak BGP5, right? And that's, that's the way that things are done. Um, and uh, for now, <clears throat> um, I think that, will, that has already allowed them to sort of try out new idea, ideas. Some choose to simplify and reduce down to a very, very small number of protocols. Unfortunately, they all choose to simplify in different ways based on their own experiences, but you know, that's, uh, that's up to them. Uh, they have to deal with the, the consequences in, internally. Some choose to make it richer in order to add things. Uh, we may or may not do that ourselves, but they're the ones who own the network. So you know, it's up to them if that works for them, but they still need to maintain a basic subset. Now you could imagine over time, just to sort of run with your scary thought that a couple of operators, maybe a cloud service provider and an ISP might get together and say, hey, we'll form our own mini uh, you know, autonomous system perhaps. And outside on the boundaries of that, we will continue to speak the standard BGP, but internally we're gonna do something that is richer and better. We're gonna actually allow ourselves to do something that is, that is better just between, just between the two of us of us you know that could go very well if they can actually improve things because then that could grow over time you might get these islands that eventually become connected it could go very well it could go very badly but that's always true with software you know you can do good things and you can do bad things and i think that uh we we it's good to enable people to try these things out because the good ideas will live on and the bad ideas hopefully will die out so I'm not too, I, you know, I, overall, I'm not too worried about it because I think that the, the vested interest of, in the end, having a network that is very reliable, very secure and connects to all of the end customers is going to incentivize people to do the right thing or they're going to go out of business. Okay. Uh, we'll go to, there's a question on the chat, uh, Nick, by talk. Oh, great. Talk. Um, other than the extern model, do you have any thoughts on how to unify the P4 and CEPBF programming model? I.e. you can compile P4 to EBBF, yep, but it doesn't produce very efficient code, agreed. And the reverse is hard. Can compilers be made smart enough to bridge this gap? Are we doomed to have a bifurcated ecosystem? I really, really hope that we're not doomed to have a bifurcated ecosystem. I think that that would be, I, 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 I think we should, uh, we deserve to be slapped if that happens, right? Because we've got these two ways of doing things. They're optimized for different environments. So EPPF is fantastic for the kernel. P4 is fantastic for the hardware accelerator. They're similar, they're not the same. And as I said, you can't efficiently necessarily um, uh, compile from what in, in both directions super easily. That's why we should work together to, to figure out how to, how to bring, these, bring, bring these things together. Um, and uh, if we if we know that there is code that is always going to uh, sit in the in the kernel, we should do it in the ways that we're familiar with. If we know it's always going to sit on an accelerator, we should do it in the way that we're familiar with. But at the boundary between the two, figuring out how you can express in one that will generate efficient code for both, I think that's the key. I really do think that's the key. So you can't do that easily today. I do think that it will mean probably that things that you know that need to move to an accelerator, you are gonna to have to create it in a constrained language which is designed to operate on an accelerator. Um, and um, it doesn't have to be P4, but P4 is such an example of a language that allows you to express in a familiar way, tables, parsing, actions, control flow, in a way that's familiar to us that would allow it to move to an accelerator. But if you know it's never gonna go on an accelerator, no point in doing that at all. And then the question is, how do you build that pipeline? How do you put things together in a pipeline such that you can drop in those different, those different pieces? I don't know the answer. I have a rough, rough idea of how it might look, uh, 
but uh, it, it's going to take a concerted effort by us to, to figure that out. But let's not end up with a bifurcated ecosystem. That would be crazy. It would be just shooting ourselves in the foot if we do that. Uh, there's, there's no need to do that. The question there um, about the, the scope of the P4 and integrated NICs. Um, So this was from Salil. Um, so I think if I understand the correct, the, 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 your question correctly, Salil, uh, I think it's about the, the constraints that you have in, 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 in a NIC. Now, you know, NICs have to go into a slot that's power limited. I don't remember the exact number, you know, it's 50, 60, 70 watts, something like that as a maximum for the, for the power that it can consume in PCIe. Um, and, you know, you've got to choose how you allocate that power very carefully. The, the basic fixed function foundational NICs today uh, have a relatively low power. They're, they're not doing very much other than processing the packets in and out onto the, onto the wire. As you add more functionality to that, uh, you know, there's, some, some folks are running entire uh, operating systems and VM monitors and all sorts of other things down on the, on the smart NIC, on the on CPU cores that's running software that might otherwise run on the, on the server CPUs. The power of the pipeline that's doing the packet processing as the packets go through, I think is always gonna be a small fraction of the overall power of a smart NIC. So this isn't, this isn't the power problem for a smart NIC. So introducing a, programmable, uh, fast programmable accelerator isn't going to be the issue. It's that you're going to have a whole load of CP, CPU cores there, or rather people seem to want to have a large number of CPU cores there as well. And that's going to dictate the power. So I'm not particularly worried about the, the hardware accelerator portion of it. By all means ask a follow-up if I, if I missed the point of your question. Um, Christian has a question there. It seems allowing for stateful programming would allow for very powerful network programs. However, it also seems to be hard to do generalized without ending up with an NPU. Are we stuck with limited stateful techniques if we want to use something like P4? Um, this isn't actually a question of P4. It's really got to do with the ability to do things at line rate. Um, and uh, so P4 is just really kind of a reflection of the fact that in order to be able to do things at line rate, you want to limit the number of loops, the number of uh, the number of uh, you know cycles that a packet would go through in in processing. So in in stateful processing, think about what stateful processing typically is. It's indexing into some state, and then potentially modifying and updating that state as a packet goes through. Uh, if you can do that as a read, modify, write on some table, as is typical of the switch and NIC pipelines, then there's, it's not really, it, it, it doesn't really have a performance uh, problem associated with it. It's harder to design the hardware to do a read, modify, write rather than just a read on a table, but the pipelines already exist in order to do that to some limited amount. So Tofino does it, some of the smart NICs do it as well. So that doesn't actually slow the packets down, um, consumes slightly more power to do a read, modify, write than just simply a read. In the end, it's not a very large fraction of the overall power. If you want to do things like un, um, sort of decapsulate a very, very large number of headers that is beyond the length of a pipeline, then that can get tricky. So if you've designed a pipeline with 10 stages, and now you do segment routing with 25 <laughs> headers on the front, then you may end up having to recirculate a packet because of the serial dependency of unwrapping them, if in fact you need to unwrap all of them at a single point. Um, so then, then, but I would, I would sort of put it to just that we also need to design the things that we do a little bit more carefully so we don't introduce such crazy amounts of processing. Um, one of the reasons, if I may ramble a little bit, one of the reasons that these switch pipelines tend not to have that many stages is because of protocol layering. In protocol layering, if you think about it, the, the reason for having the layers in the first place was for a separation of concerns, a, a separation of what's happening at each, at, at each independent header. And typically we add an extra layer of encapsulation because we want to introduce a new independent function that's not represented by the underlying protocols. So it tends not to be dependent. 
And so you can end up doing many of these processing stages in parallel. So for example, it's common for 20, 25 different operations to be done in parallel in a single stage of a forwarding pipeline if there's no serial, if there's no serial dependency. Um, when we're designing new headers, we should probably be careful and mindful of the fact that if we add in too much extra dependency, whether it's massive amounts of nested encapsulation, that we're gonna pay for it in the end in some kind of processing, whatever that processing element is. So we need to be thoughtful. We don't wanna restrict what we do too much, but um, uh, we, I, I think it just, it just tells us that we have to be thoughtful about the way that we do that. Uh, Nick, you skipped uh, Andrew Collins' question. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that one. Sorry, it's scrolled off the top here. Let me see if I can get to that one. Oh yeah, another somewhat related question. In GPUs, the extension model of OpenGL ended up being used for a wide variety of vendor-specific extension that caused significant portability problems. Yeah, great question. Um, so the, the idea of the PSA, the portable switch architecture in P416, um, is to encourage portability around basic operations. So parsing, standard match and action uh, primitives and a standard uh, control flow through the, through the program. So the PSA or the portable switch architecture uh, is a good starting point. So Tofino, for example, is a, is a superset of the portable switch architecture. Other switches that people have developed or are developing are a superset of the portable switch architecture. So code written for one should work on the others as long as it conforms to that PSA. That's good for basic functions. And so hopefully we'll allow portability of things which are basic operations because that PSA is kind of designed to be able to do all the things that we normally expect to be able to do as encapsulation, decapsulation, telemetry, all of these kinds of things. However, if you want to add something in there, which is very, very different, um, some type of uh, key value store lookup or some kind of sort of Paxos implementation, for example, that's done streaming in the hardware, you may or may not find that the hardware is capable of doing it. Um, in which case you've got to add that extension. So I think that the, 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 the important the important thing is that over time, as we observe the kinds of programs that people are creating, we need to evolve the portable switch architecture. And uh, there's a backward compatibility versioning problem here. We're going to make sure that we don't do it too aggressively. Otherwise, we're going to prevent, you know, prevent code from being portable uh, uh, in a backward compatible way. So we've got to be mindful, though, of doing this for switches and for NICs. There's a working group at the moment on the portable NIC architecture for evolving smart NICs to try and accomplish the same thing for NICs. And NICs have different architectures. They have different needs. They've got the whole interaction with PCIe and the host and the host memory. And so they need to be capable of being extended in that direction. As we learn what operations every NIC has and every switch has, it's imperative that we go back and try and add it to a portable switch or portable NIC model to encourage that portability. So we've got to be very, uh, we've got to be very mindful. And I think it's upon us to try and make sure that that happens. Uh, any other questions? I have a question, Nick. So your slide which you showed the big picture of essentially you're programming the network now. It's a hierarchy of devices. Uh, you're programming from one programming point of view, uh, assuming intent of some form of what, what you want achieved. Uh, do you see that as hierarchically, the processing is hierarchical where you would do, let's say offload something on the NIC, that, that computation doesn't get repeated on the host. Likewise, if you offload on the switch. So there's a hierarchy of computation Mm -hmm. as opposed to the current model where if I write a P4 program, I'm describing the whole full uh, process uh, pipeline, basically. I think, uh, yeah. With the so in a way, I think that, the, that um, what's happened because of disaggregation is that we now have, uh, we have abstractions in two dimensions. We have abstractions of, <clears throat> of the forwarding plane you know, the old layering model and, you know, the, the seven, four layer model, whatever we want to call it, right? So we had that abstraction that had been around for a long time. What's happened over the last 10 years is people have started to create their own, their own control planes. We've got this hierarchy that moves vertically in the control plane and those layers of abstraction. For anyone here that hasn't seen Scott Schenker's talk on network abstractions, 
I think it's called the history of the history of protocols and the future of networking or something that was from about 2011, 2012. I think it's the best video I've ever seen or the best, best talk I've seen about sort of where networking is heading from a sort of how we're going to control it. It's about the creation of abstractions in the vertical direction as well as the horizontal direction. So there, there, there's, there's lots of room for confusion, All right. So is processing that takes place on a server that could be control plane software, it could be data plane forwarding software. And right now we tend to separate those and that's probably a good thing to do. Otherwise we're going to go crazy unless we separate those, uh, those two portions. But as more and more of it moves to being expressed in code, whether it's at the end host or in the forwarding plane, then we will start to blur, blur those lines. So that abstraction that I showed of a forwarding pipeline that has a clean separation to a control plane and applications that run over top, that's just an example. Uh, that, that seems to work quite well. There are many that are heading in that direction right now. That may not be the endpoint, and that's fine. Uh, so I think that there will be a hierarchy in both directions over, over, over time. And we just have to be mindful of allowing a clean expression and the ability to be able to test validate both at the time of writing the code, visualizing what it means for the device it's being programmed for, validating the behavior in the wild. And that's, that, you know, that, that will be imperative. <clears throat> If you had something specific in mind, Jamal, then, then happy to chat about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've, I've been struggling with this for some time. I mean, we, you know, is, for, for example, on smart NIC, uh, on the host side, do I want to do reclassification again, or could I just receive a tag, which tells me what's been done on the NIC, likewise. And in, in, the, yeah. in the scope of, um, do, I, I think that in your own private network, you can you can literally define your own P4 program. I'm thinking maybe um, for a few hours you run a brand new protocol altogether, and then you know remove all your code, and somebody else will install a, another propriety data path. That's hierarchical. Yes. Uh, to achieve a specific uh, goal. And if you're going to do hierarchical, then um, the, the, more, the program paradigm changes, right? It's not, it's no longer just, I'm going to write some eBPF code or a P4 module that, uh, that's local to the process. It's, it's as if I take the match actions and I spread them across the hierarchies as opposed to. Yes. Yeah. No, I think this is, I, I, I think this actually gets to the essence of the problem, right? You've got behavior that at the time that you're creating it, you're not quite sure whether it belongs in one place or the other will get replicated or needs to move and even needs to move dynamically depending on the particular, you know, whether you're talking remotely to someone over a, over a, you know, many, many layers of hierarchy or locally just over an, over an accelerator. So you can easily imagine repetition of function and that function over time, you might want to optimize to be able to remove the repetition, or you may want to be able to move it or enable or disable it if you're finding that it's being repeated in multiple locations. So the, the, we mustn't think of it as separate pieces. We really mustn't. Um, um, uh, uh, I, I, we, I think we would be missed, you know, I think your question gets to the, to, to, to the danger here. If we think of it as we're programming a NIC, we're programming a switch, we're programming a kernel, we're programming, we're doing user space programming. If we keep thinking in that, 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 uh, that separate, that separate balkanized way, then, um, then we will never, we will never make it easy. We will just present the developer with more complexity. So thinking about how things can move across that boundary. That's why I think we have to think of how you can express behavior that will run efficiently in a kernel, that you could pick up that behavior and then move it and run it in a hardware accelerator in a NIC. You, can't, you don't just have the choice of putting it in a core out on a NIC. You can put it on the accelerator in the NIC, or you can move it out to the switch if that benefits you. And eventually, because it, because if we can do that, eventually <clears throat> the programmer doesn't even have to make that choice themselves. They express the behavior that they want, and then it's dynamically moved depending on the best way to allocate it across that pipeline. I know that sounds, sounds crazy now, but within a decade, why can't we be there? Such that you can express that behavior, you know, for examples I gave on congestion control and routing. If I want that behavior and I don't particularly care where it is that the RTT is measured, whether it's in the kernel, whether it's in the NIC, or if it's some assistance between the NICs and the switches, 
Why do I, as a, as a developer, care? Why can't I figure it out for me? That's what abstraction should bring me over time, the ability for it to place that function at the place that's optimal. And if it finds that it's repeating it in the wrong places, it should remove it and I should, shouldn't even need to know. Um, yeah, I'll get my hobby horse a little bit and say, you know, if you notice when you get networking folks together in a room or, you know, like this, we, we tend to end up talking about packet header formats and bits and things like that. All right, it, it would be a bit like two, I don't know, Java programmers that were talking about uh, register allocation. You know, it's, it, abstraction means that we shouldn't need to, to worry about these low level details, but in networking, we still do. And uh, it's, I think it's our job to try and make it to liberate us from having to worry about these things. And so your question is right on about that. Okay, uh, Shujit, uh, you, you're trying to make a comment on? Well, I mean, I, I think hey, I was just, hey, Nick, nice to see you again. Um, I was actually just costing off of your point, uh, Jamal, which is the hierarchy. By the way, I'm actually, Nick, this is sort of a question for you as well. I mean, as we get into the notion of being able to move things around, one very practical thing that I think we'll end up with is an intermediate representation, right? I mean, if you think really, if you carry even your Java analogy to the extreme, if you really are saying that, the objects could live anywhere you want. You will have to have sort of a compiler intermediate mm -hmm. that lives across your networking continuum, whether it's the kernel, it's the switch or the NIC or the core on the NIC, right? Because the example that you run into all the time is if I'm doing overlay networking, the overlay routing tables being replicated, identical routing tables being re replicated in every switch, in every NIC, yep. sorry, uh, makes no sense. It's a giant waste of DRAM. Yep. But you want the application of the NCAP DCAP in the NIC because that's the best place to do it. So you end up with some something, right? You have to be able to say, okay, I'm going to do the NCAP DCAP classification and I'm going to tell the switch to actually put the header on because you might as well put the header there. So, so I think in, in addition to your mix, there has to be another like, okay, if the two of you are cooperating, mm -hmm. this is a set of tags or this is a set of, uh, symbols that you can exchange and continue with. Yeah, possibly. Yes. And I mean, I think that <clears throat> um, a means of expressing a behavior that can readily be accelerated or, or exploit all of the generality of a, of a CPU based on whether it's needed. And then the ability to move between the two. Uh, it's, the, it's when you want to be able to move between the two clearly, which is the hard case, because you want to exploit the generality of the CPU and you want it hardware accelerated. And those two things are our intention with each other. So it's that case. I hope that we don't end up with a way that burdens both of the extremes just for the sake of the middle ground. And that's that's the that's the tricky part. And so I think that uh, you know allowing that 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 freedom to do things that are expressed entirely in the hardware accelerator language or entirely in the CPU language is important so that we don't <clears throat> restrict those when they don't need to be restricted. It's that middle ground that's gonna be the tricky. And then intermediate representation may be the right way to do it. Um, and, and, and I think that's, that's, why, that's why I think we've got to get our heads together around that, right? And that's my point. I think if we don't take a hard stance on that mm -hmm. intermediate, exactly as you said, right? The, yeah. the tension to innovate in different vectors Mm -hmm. will result in sort of canceling the other side out. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and you, you know, just to sort of make a, maybe this is a, this is a, this is a poor taste uh, sort of analogy, but you know, <laughs> you look at how it, it, the insides of movements where there are different ideas, whether political movements, religious movements over, over time, there, there's always this sort of, this tendency to get very stuck on a particular approach. And we, you know, the, 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 and everybody gets expelled from the party or from the, from the region that they're not sort of following the particular model. And where there's sort of breakout innovation is where people can figure out the best of two ideas and bring them, bring them together. And uh, so, you know, we, we need to, I think just to sort of avoid any infighting, we're going to sort of try and figure out how we can bring these two together. And I think the only way to do it is there are two good organizations with uh, p4.org and, 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 and NetDev and figuring out how those can, in a very informed way, just figure out a, a solution to this. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. Uh, I, Nate Foster, unfortunately, wasn't able to join us. He's sort of the technical lead of P4 and uh, he's su super interested in doing that. I talked to him a few days ago. He's uh, in the woods right now, but uh, he'd, he'd be uh, delighted to be a part of that as well. So resource, resource management and all that, discovery, 
will have to be built. So uh, uh, is the is this intermediate representation going to take that? Because you, this stuff gets to be runtime, right? You're not controlling one device, you're controlling a hierarchy of devices. And, uh, you know, both horizontally and vertically, right? Yeah, uh, I think eventually that we will need, uh, eventually, so I, I do think it it's still, um, it's still most pragmatic to keep the control and the data plane expression separate from each other. You're creating a pipeline for which you then control. I mean, we tend to do that whether we're writing, you know, uh, CPU code or or forwarding plane code. And um, you know, this is where this P4 runtime model came came about as the generation of an API. And uh, it actually has a lot of benefits that uh, that 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 sort of general model of taking the expression of the forwarding behavior and generating the API to control it. I think there may be something to borrow there in the separation of the two dimensions of the control from the forwarding. But then when you have a hierarchy of things that are that are in the forwarding plane, then um, I, if I, I think we should try to figure out how to, to express it as a pipeline. I, you know, th this may just be a different sort of philosophical standing point. I tend to think of the layering as sometimes the, in the forwarding plane as sometimes useful, sometimes getting in the way. Right, so the example that Shriji gave of overlay networking as having this whole other layer in the hierarchy. If you're trying to accelerate it, you wanna know as little about that as possible and collapse it down into, I'm just doing a lookup. I don't care where it is, whether it's in the kernel or the user space or out on the NIC or in the vSwitch or in the physical switch, I shouldn't have to care about it. I'm doing a lookup. I just need it to get done somewhere and I need to know that it happened. And uh, so I think that if we can if we can think that we're accelerating and, and humans are not going to be very good at, at collapsing that hierarchy. And so I think that's where where a compilation and automation will be our friend and we'll need to do that. Otherwise we'll get it wrong. Uh, we, can, we can continue if people want still have questions. Otherwise we are right on time. Any other questions? Oh, Jamal, thank you, I have. Yep. Go ahead. Hey, Jamal, this is Anjali. Hey, uh, uh -huh. Nick, sorry, I joined late and I missed most of your talk. Uh, but I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, thank you and Jamal for such an interesting, uh, you know, philosophical debate about where we need to be <laughs> rather than, you know, I mean, Yes, the, there's the technical aspect of it, but the bigger picture where, uh, you know, we put it from from uh, what is the minimum we need to achieve um, effective networking. Uh, I think that was really useful to think through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. It's. I, I see a little red flashing dot that says it's being recorded. If that's useful later. <laughs> Any other questions? Christian, is that a question or you, it's a comment? The more general it's the hardware problem. is, the more I can offload to it, but then we end up with an NPU and that's not efficient. I agree 100%. So we've got to be very careful, right? A hardware accelerator is, is an accelerator so long as it's accelerating something and, and sort of falling back to that NPU model would be, would be a big mistake. So I think we're to think in terms of we're accelerating things through a specific structure Deeply pipeline, lots of parallelism, uh, uh, and a parallelism that's fitted with packet processing and huge amounts of I/O. As soon as we move away from that, it ain't going to be very good as an accelerator. Bye, bye everybody. Look forward to working with everybody. Bye, bye now. <laughs>